Welcome to the series Indian Polity by M. Lakshmikant. This would be our lecture number 17 and before this we have been seeing a number of topics and presently we are in the topic historical background. So, we will continue with the topic historical background in this present lecture as well. I am Babu Gunashekaran, faculty Indian Polity and Governance, study IQ English. I have also secured All India Rank 337 in Civil Service Examination 2016. And before that, I also briefly worked as an assistant commandant in CISF, Central Industrial Security Force. And I also been engaging in helping students, mentoring students and teaching the students preparing for civil service examination for the last 8 to 10 years. The idea behind doing this particular series is to help the students preparing for civil service examination 2024 and after. And to get the maximum benefit, try to watch all the lectures as a part of this particular series. I am very sure that students who are following the series will be definitely benefit at the end of this particular series. So, we will just continue and we will move on to the topic that we have been discussing that is the historical background. So, in the last class, we have been discussing on the historical background. In the last class, if you see, we have been uh, completed the Government of India Act 1919. And that is where we are right now in the historical background. So, what is this particular topic historical background is all about? The topic historical background gives us an idea as to how the various constitutional and legal developments that has happened in British India when the Britishers were ruling India, how these developments have influenced the Constituent Assembly when they were drafting the constitution for independent India. And basically, if you look into this uh, constitutional developments, these developments have happened in two phases. One is during the company rule, which is from the period of 1773, starting the Regulating Act of 1773 till the Charter Act of 1853, that which came to an end in 1857 during the, uh, uh, the, the first uh, revolt of Indian independence, that is the Sipai Mutiny in 1857. And then the second phase of constitutional developments, which is more important from the point of view of examination, the second era of constitutional development has started in 1858 with the passing of the Government of India Act 1858 and then it continued till uh, 1947 that is the Indian Independence Act 1947. So, in this process we have already understood the Government of India Act 1919 in the previous lecture. So, we will continue further and today in this particular lecture we will try to understand as to what happened in the Government of India Act 1935, what are the reasons to bring in this Government of India Act 1935, what are the various constitutional reforms that has been brought in in the Government of India Act 1935 and what is the influence of this Government of India Act in the present constitution of India and then we will also touch upon the Indian Independence Act 1947. So, that is the objective of today's class. So, let me just uh, get into the respective slide, but before I get into the respective slide, let me also give a brief background of what we have been discussing very quickly, so that uh, students watching this particular lecture, they may have a continuity in our understanding. So, let me just go to the slide that is which deals with the Government of India Act 1919, which we have done in the last class. So, we will have to start with the Government of India Act 1935. So, what has happened? The Britishers came to India almost around the 17th century, the beginning of 17th century and they came to India as traders and a few British traders, they have got rights from the British crown and in fact, they have got the monopoly rights to trade with India and later they established what is called as the East India Company and that East India Company was uh, a trading company in India, nothing more than that. For the first 150 years or so, they were just a trading company. Subsequently, they entered into, they, they have seen an opportunity for them to have a political control in India and they have engaged in war with uh, the Indian rulers and some of the significant battles include the Battle of Plassey and the Battle of Buxar. And subsequently, they also become a political authority in our country because they also had their own territory after winning the battles. And then subsequently, the company started administering India, the British India. And to administer the company, various acts has been passed starting the Regulating Act of 1773 and then we have seen the uh, Act of Settlement 1781 to basically rectify the flaws in the Regulating Act. Then we have seen the Pitts India Act which is to bring in more efficiency into the system of administration which has for the first time brought in the dual system of government. 
which includes the court of directors and also the board of control. The court of directors would look into the commercial functions of the company and the board of control would look into the administrative affairs with regard to the Indian administration. And then we had the next set of charter acts. We had the charter act of 1793, we had charter act of 1813 and then we had the charter act of 1833 and then we had the charter act of 1853 which is the time which we call as the company rule. In 1857, there was a Sepoy mutiny, which is also called as the revolt of 1857, which is also called as the first war of Indian independence. And subsequent to the Sepoy mutiny, the British realized that uh, the administration which is done by the company is not efficient. And henceforth, the administration of British India has to be directly transferred to the British crown. In the name of the crown, the authority was given to a particular authority who is called as a Secretary of State. A new office was created, Secretary of State. And that Secretary of State, who is a member in the British cabinet, he is a responsible minister to the British cabinet. So, it is his responsibility to carry out administration in our country. The Secretary of State had his own representative sitting here in India and that is none other than the Viceroy. So, the Viceroy is like a Chief Executive Officer who will be there in India, who will be reporting to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of State will be responsible to the British Crown and he can be questioned and he can be made accountable in the British Parliament. And this was a scheme of things which was brought in in the Government of India in 1858. Now, after the Government of India in 1858, a series of uh, reforms has been brought in, which is called as the Indian Councils Act. In fact, three Indian Councils Act was brought in, Indian Council Act of 1861, Indian Council Act of 1892, and then the Indian Council Act of 1909. To put it very basically, what is this Council Acts? All these acts try to bring in some kind of reforms with regard to the legislative functions of the Viceroy's Council and also with regard to the executive functions of the Council. And gradually and steadily, not only the Viceroy's Council, but also the Governor's Council in various provinces, they also started expanding. They started expanding the composition of the Legislative Council and they also allowed the representation of Indians into this Legislative Council. Not only into the Legislative Council, gradually there was also in representation in the Viceroy's Executive Council as well. So basically the name Councils Act because they started expanding the scope and the functions of the Council and thereby they were trying to bring in more representative form of government, although not as representative as we have a constitution today, gradual constitutional reforms was brought in. Because they thought that gradual constitutional reforms is also in the best interest of the British to administer India without any revolt or something. So, that is what is the idea behind all these reforms. Now, 1909, the Indian Councils Act, which is also called as the Marley Minto reforms, it has increased the composition in the uh, Legislative Council. In fact, in the provinces, if you see, there was non-official uh, majorities. And then the Indians were also represented in the Viceroy's Executive Council. So, all these things are good developments, but still it is uh, far from what the Indians were demanding for themselves. And then came the Government of India Act 1919 to bring in much more advancement into the way that India is administered, British India is administered. 1919 Act for the first time brought in the demarcation between the central and the state subject, the central and the provincial subjects. Although please understand, although they have demarcated certain functions between the center and the provincial governments, but however please understand the government still continue to be a unitary government. But this is the first time where such demarcation has happened. The provinces are allowed to make their own budgets. But one of the biggest uh, criticism of this government of India Act 1919, despite the developments it has brought in, is that it has brought in a system of diarchy, a system of dual government. Wherein the provinces, the matters of administration will be divided into transferred subjects and reserved subjects. Those which are important to the Britishers will be carried out by the governor and his executive council and which they felt not an important portfolio will be given to the ministers who are elected by the uh, people, which means there was an election and then through the legislative council there were few ministers who were uh, appointed and these ministers will carry out the transferred items. But this system uh, proved to be a failure because there is no proper coordination between the uh, reserved subjects and the transferred subjects and ultimately this system failed and it is one of the biggest criticism of the government of India in 1919. 
the Indian uh, uh, National Congress and the people who are part of the freedom struggle, they are also not happy with the other developments that has happened in the government of India Act 1919. The government of India Act 1919 expanded the scope of communal electorate. There was a system of direct election, but the representation was very, very less in terms of adult suffrage. There was a very limited adult suffrage. So, for all these reasons, they then demanded that they wanted to bring in more constitutional reforms. And if you look into the Government of India Act 1919, the Government of India Act 1919 also provides one of the provision as a part of this particular act, that this act, once it comes into force, it may be reviewed and it can be looked upon by a specific commission as to how it has functioned over a period of time after this act came, com, comes into force and once 10 year lapse after 10 years there can be a relook into the various provisions of this particular act so based on this particular provision in 1927 in 1927 a specific committee was uh, sorry a commission was appointed and that is called as the simon commission simon commission was appointed to review the government of india act 1919 and to suggest as to what kind of constitutional reforms can be further brought in to govern India. It is called a Simon Commission because of the chairman of this particular commission was Simon and hence the Simon Commission was appointed basically to look into the Government of India Act and to suggest further constitutional reforms. The Simon Commission was completely opposed by the Indian National Congress and the Indians in general because none of these person in the Simon Commission was an Indian. There was no Indian representation in this particular commission. So, the basic criticism of this particular commission is that this commission main agenda is to bring in further constitutional reforms and to bring in constitutional reforms based on which the people of India are to be governed, but there is no representation of the Indians and that is something which is not acceptable, but still the government go has gone ahead with this particular commission. And subsequently, the commission submitted its report uh, after two years, around 1929, the commission submitted its report. And based on the report of the committee, in fact, the committee was in favor of the communal electorate. So, they were looking into the provisions of the Government of India Act 1919. So, they favored uh, certain provisions of Government of India Act, like uh, to increase the communal representation further and uh, to bring in federalism uh, into the country to distribute the powers between the center and the states. But one thing that they are not favor of is the system of diarchy, which was introduced by the Government of India 1919 in the provinces. They said that the system of diarchy is not very efficient. So, most of these recommendations, you will understand that it has been later incorporated in the Government of India 1935. So, this commission submitted the report and what happened subsequently? This report was taken up by the British government. Then the British government held uh, conferences, round table conference with the Indian representatives to bring in uh, further constitutional reforms. In fact, to be very specific, uh, three round table conferences are held between the British government and the Indian representatives. And then subsequently based on all the inputs, uh, all these matters were referred to a select committee in the British parliament. And based on the report which is given by the select committee in the British parliament, then came the next legislation which is called as the Government of India Act 1935. So, Government of India Act 1935, why it is significant? Because it is the last piece of legislation which is passed by the British Parliament before India got its independence. And in fact, it is based on this Government of India Act 1935, the British India was ruled till India got independence. And you will, you will also understand that even after India got independence, it was still ruled by the Government of India Act 1935, still India had its own constitution because the Indian constitution came into force only on 26 January 1950. And the constant assembly which was working in drafting the constitution of India effectively after 1947, they had a lot of insights and they have taken a lot of provisions from the Government of India Act 1935 and they have incorporated into the Indian constitution and that is why understanding the provision of the Government of India Act 1935 is very, very important. So, with this particular background, let us now try to understand as to what are the various provisions that was inserted into the Government of India Act 1935 and what are the things that you have carried forward in the same format or in a little deviated form in the present constitution of India. So, come to the Government of India Act 1935. So, what was the objective of this Government of India Act 1935? 
the very objective of this government of india act 1935 is to bring in more responsible and a representative form of government the indian representatives and the indian national congress was not happy with the 1919 reforms they are not happy with the piecemeal developments that has happened because by this time it was an established principle that india should be governed by the indians so this is the time that they already started demanding that they should have a constant assembly of their own for uh, drafting their own constitution in fact the indian national congress made that uh, to have a constant assembly as an official policy by 1934 itself so this time the uh, government of india act 1935 was brought in of course it had made changes it has made the system more responsible and representative but ultimately we'll understand that the indians are not happy with the government of india act 1935 also but it has definitely increased the responsibility of the elected government and it has made the system of government more representative so what are the significant provisions of this government of india act 1935 for the first time it has brought in an all india federation that's the most important thing you have to understand many times has been asked in the examination when i say it, for the first time it has brought in the all india federation that means this is the first time you will understand that the responsibilities between the center and the provincial government has been divided and not only that the division of powers are provided but please understand this is the first time that it was given a statutory backing so there was division of powers there was division of powers between the center and the states in fact in 1919 also there was division of powers the demarcation of subjects but there was no statutory backing so here there was a statutory backing it was backed by the government of india act 1935 itself whereas in the government of india act 1919 it was only a delegation it was delegated by the central authority to the provinces which can be taken back at any point of time but that is not possible under the government of india act 1935 because whatever is a subject or whatever is the division of powers that has been backed by the statute itself unless until you make an amendment to this that cannot be violated so an all india federation was provided with the british provinces and the princely states as the units of this particular federation that's one of the major development now what is the significance in fact you will understand that the same type of federation was carried forward in the indian constitution as well which will subsequently summarize and by providing an all india federation the government of india 1935 provided for three types of list it provided for the federal list a provincial list and a concurrent list a federal list on which the central government will have the power to carry out the administration and the central legislature will have the power to make laws a provincial list on which the provincial legislature can make laws and the provincial government can carry out the administration concurrent list in which both the provincial legislature as well as the central legislature can make the laws but in case of conflict over the laws the central legislation will prevail over the provincial legislation and there was also something which is called as the residuary powers which was given to the viceroy again please understand very important a residuary power to the viceroy is the power of law making for the viceroy on those subject matters which is not mentioned in any of these three lists that is either in the federal list provincial list or the concurrent list so in those areas who will have the power to make laws it is the viceroy who will have the power to make laws if you see in the present constitution of india also there is something which is called as a residuary powers but in the present constitution the residuary powers is not given to an authority similar to that of viceroy but in the present constitution the power to make laws under the residuary items is a, has been given to the parliament of india so please understand how the government of india act has influenced so the idea of uh, residuary powers of law making has been taken but however it was not given to the an authority similar to that of viceroy because today we do not have a viceroy but there can be similar authorities but instead of that the power has been given to a democratic institution that is the parliament but how the idea has been taken from the government of india 1935 so when you look into this federal list provincial list and the concurrent list so federal list means these are the subject matters where the uh, government thought that there there is a need for uniformity throughout the country so for example defense foreign affairs communications so these were under the federal list 
provincial list, the list which they thought that uh, there can be lot of differences from provinces to provinces. And those items were brought in the provincial list, say items like agriculture, police, law and order. So, these things were brought in the provincial list. And then you have the concurrent list. So, concurrent list is where both of them can make the legislations, where temporarily there can be differences, but in the long term there may be uniformity. So, all those things are placed under the concurrent list. And then the next important feature of this Government of India Act is most importantly is that the abolition of diarchy in the provinces. Because as I said that the Government of India Act 1935 is an improved version of the Government of India Act 1919. And in fact, the Simon Commission which studied the Government of India Act 1919 has been very critical of the system of diarchy. Diarchy as a system has failed. Dividing the subjects of administration into transferred subjects and reserved subjects. And because of lack of coordination between the uh, governor's executive council and the responsible ministers, the system has failed completely, and which is where the Simon Commission recommended that abolish diarchy in the provinces and bring more responsible government in the provinces. And to bring more responsible government in the provinces, you'll have to give more autonomy to the provinces. One way that they have given the autonomy is the federalism has been brought in. The second way that you can make the system more responsible in the provinces is abolish diarchy. And once you abolish diarchy, then all the portfolios will be given only to the responsible ministers. There is no distinction between as to what is transferred subject and the reserved subject. So, who will take care of the various departments within a particular province? It will all be given to a responsible minister who comes from a legislative council of that particular province and responsible and accountable to that particular legislative uh, council in that particular province. So, thereby you are making the system more responsible. So, the next development is that the diarchy has been abolished. Very, very important development that has happened in the government of India 1935. So, all the portfolios were given to the responsible minister and such type of government continued very briefly in British India from 1937 to 1939 because many of the government resigned in 1939 because of the historical developments that has happened at that point of time. So, this act also had the provision in case if the ministers resign. So, this uh, responsible ministers are similar to that of the council of ministers presently who get elected as a member of parliament uh, to the Lok Sabha uh, and then subsequently from there they become the minister. So, similarly here. So, the, the, the people get elected to the legislative council and from the legislative council they become ministers and they were given the in charge of the portfolios and they normally report to the uh, governor or the viceroy. Now, please understand, subsequently you will also understand one of the other development in this particular act is that as long as the responsible minister is there, the minister can carry out the administration who is accountable to the legislative council and also who holds office during the pleasure of the governor in every province. But suppose if the ministers resign or if the government is dismissed, then the act also says that the governor can carry out the administration under the directions of the viceroy in the absence of the elected government. So, as long as elected government is there, the ministers can carry out the administration because they are assigned the various portfolios. But once the government resigns, then there should be some authority to carry out the administration and that would be the governor himself. So, this is similar to that of the president rule in our country today. Under Article 356 of the Constitution, in today's Constitution, you will understand that if there is a constitutional breakdown, if the government is dismissed, if the government loses a majority in a particular state, then on behalf of the President, the Governor can carry out the administration. So, almost a similar provision was also there in the Government of India Act 1935. There were few more developments that has also happened. So, if you see the positive developments, one, it has uh, given powers to the states the provinces and thereby it has brought in a federation. It has brought in more responsible uh, government in the provinces and it has increased the autonomy of the provinces. So, these are the positive developments which is also now carried forward in the present constitution. The Government of India Act 1935 also has abolished, although they have abolished the diarchy in the provinces, but they have brought in diarchy in the center. In center, they had the diarchy system. That means, uh, in the central government where the administrative head is the viceroy himself, still there were two subjects which is the reserved subjects and the transferred subjects 
but this system was never put to use, but the act had this particular scheme. And for the first time, you will understand the government of India 1935 also brought in what is called as bicameralism. So, bicameralism in certain provinces was brought in. So, bicameralism means having two houses. Now, please understand bicameralism was not there in the provinces in the government of India 1919. In the government of India 1919, bicameralism was only in the central legislature. But the government of India 1935 has brought in bicameralism in certain provinces as well. So, at that point of time, there were 11 provinces, but out of 11 provinces, 6 provinces was having bicameralism. So, what are those 6 provinces? The province of Bengal, Bombay, Bihar, Assam, Madras, United Province. The major provinces were having bicameralism. So, they were having a legislative assembly as well as a legislative council. So, this development has also happened by the government of India 1935. And most importantly, the direct election was further expanded. So, most of the members both in the central uh, legislature as well as in the state uh, provincial legislature, they were all elected by direct election. Direct election means the people had the right to vote, but however, you will have to understand that it was not on the basis of universal adult suffrage, but it was a limited adult suffrage. But the development that has happened by the government of India in 1935 is Although it is a limited adult suffrage, now the government of India 1935 has expanded further the scope of the adult suffrage in comparison to that of the government of India 1919. Government of India 1919 gave voting rights to less than 10 percent of the people, which is now increased up to 10 percent of the people in our country. Again, based on the same factors like the property tax that they pay and the uh, the educational qualification or the status that they possess in the society, depending upon all these things, the franchise was given to them. And another development that has happened in the government of India 1935 is the extension of the separate electorate. The idea of separate electorate as a policy was brought in in government in the Indian Council Act 1909. And that is why Lord Minto came to be what is called as the father of communal electorate in our country. But when Minto introduces communal electorate system in 1909, he introduced that only for the Muslims, which was further extended for the benefit of the Britishers and to give impetus to their dividend rule policy. It was further extended in the government of India in 1919. From the Muslims, it was extended to the Sikhs, the Anglo-Indians, the Europeans and the Indian Christians. But now that principle was further extended. It was further extended to the depressed classes. It was extended to the depressed classes, that is the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes. So they were also part of the uh, separate electorate system. And it was also extended to women and labors, which was uh, not accepted by the Indian leaders. They were not happy about this particular development, but they did not have much control over this as well. And then if you see one of the significant development that has happened in the government of India 1935 is also it has provided for establishment of federal uh, service commission, which is equivalent to that of the today Union Public Service Commission. And they also allowed for appointment of provincial uh, commissions, which is similar to that of provincial service commissions, which is similar to that of the state public service commission and also joint public service commission. So today under the constitution, under article 315 of the constitution, to be very specific, there is a provision for appointing the Union Public Service Commission, State Public Service Commission and also for a Joint Public Service Commission for two or more states. Now, all these things has been taken from the government of India 1935. So, if you look into the significance of this government of India 1935, it is an advanced version of uh, definitely the government of India 1919. So, what are the things? It has definitely made the system more representative in nature. It has definitely brought in more system of democracy, although not like the present constitution, but better version of government of India 1919. It has brought in federalism into our country, which is part of the Indian constitution to see as to what are the influence of the government of India 1935 in the constitution of India today. Federalism was brought in and then we have also seen how the residuary powers was there already in the government of India 1935, which is in a modified version today we have in the constitution. 
uh, some form of the uh, precedent rule which is today there in the constitution already it had a similar provision in the government of India 1935. So, that was also uh, influence and then you can understand bicameralism in provinces today. So, today in provinces we have the bicameralism, the direct election which was limited at that point of time, today it has been made an universal adult suffrage in our country. And then the separate electorate, the government of India realized that separate electorate is very dangerous and they knew that this should not happen. Because of their experiences in the government of India 1935, the separate electorate system was done away with and instead of that today we have what is called as reservation and reservation not for everyone but for the depressed classes that is for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. The reservation is provided in the elections. And then we have the system of the public service commissions and the merit based recruitment which is very well uh, embedded in the government of India 1935. So, all these things are the significant impact of the government of India 1935 in the present constitution of India. But then after the government of India 1935 was passed, the Indian leadership and the Indian National Congress was not happy. Uh, with the developments that they ha that has happened by the government of India in 1935 because at that point of time it was already a well established principle that they wanted complete independence and any constitution of India has to be drafted only by the Indians and they already started making demands for the constituent assembly and the demand for constituent assembly for the first time officially recognized by the Britishers uh, through their Cripps mission. Cripps mission was sent to India in 1942 to secure the Indians, uh, Indian army in the second world war and they said that after the war is over, uh, we will establish a constituent assembly of India where they, you can draft your own constitution. But however, nothing much materialized after the Cripps mission and then in 1945 after the end of the second world war, there was a government change in Britain, the Labour Party came to power and then they were very much in favour of giving independence to India. And to give independence, first they wanted to have some responsible transfer of power and then for this particular purpose, a mission was sent to India which is called as the cabinet mission. The cabinet mission were having three members of the British cabinet, so they came to India. The purpose and the objective behind the cabinet mission coming to India is to devise a mechanism as to how to establish the constant assembly of India. The biggest problem that they have to face is to convince both the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League to have the constituent assembly for India which was opposed to by uh, the Muslim League for the fact that the Muslim League wanted a separate country and a separate constituent assembly because they already had their own theory of uh, the two nation theory which somehow the constituent uh, the, the cabinet mission has convinced and finally the elections to the constituent assembly has happened in uh, mid of 1946. Although by June 1946 the elections have happened for the constituent assembly, the constituent assembly really did not function because still the Muslim League was adamant on its two nation theory and a separate state of Pakistan and the constituent assembly could not meet for a long period of time. But however, they realized that somehow the constituent assembly has to meet and they have to function. So, for the first time the constituent assembly met uh, in December 1946 and then the uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru introduced the objectives resolution which is the foundation of the present constitution today. But then nothing has moved even after that and then the leadership has realized, the British leadership has realized that one way or the other we will have to create a separate state of Pakistan and then that idea was accepted and approved by uh, then Viceroy of India, uh, Mountbatten, Lord Mountbatten and he came out with a plan which is called as a Mountbatten plan according to which that Pakistan is to be created as a separate state. And to give uh, effect to this particular plan, that is the Mountbatten plan, the Indian Independence Act was passed. And according to the Indian Independence Act, on 15th August 1947, the British India is to be divided into two states. One is the dominion of Pakistan, another is the dominion of India. And then each and every state would have their own constituent assembly and that constituent assembly would be a sovereign constituent assembly to draft the constitution of India. And that is a major provision of this government of India 1947. And once the government of India 1947 was passed, then subsequently the constituent assembly of India has drafted its own constitution and which was later uh, adopted and on 26 November 1949 and it came into force on 26 January 1950. And today our country is governed according to the constitution that was 
adopted and it was enacted on 26 and it was uh, adopted and enacted and subsequently it was uh, which came into force on 26 January 1950. So, now this is the history as to how India had its own constitution. So, now let us go into the Indian Independence Act of 1947. Let us try to understand some of the provisions of the Indian Independence Act 1947. So, what is the major provision of this Indian Independence Act? If you see the major provision of the Indian Independence Act, the act ended the British rule in India and declared India as an independent and a sovereign state. So, it became an independent, so it, it ended the British rule and India would become an independent state from 15th August 1947. In fact, if you look into this Indian Independence Act, it was to give effect to the Mountbatten plan as I already discussed. So, the British India is to be divided into two independent states that would be the state of India and Pakistan uh, with a dominion status. Although we say that it would be a sovereign state, but at that point of time, the status that was given is a dominion status. When you say dominion status, that means India would still continue to be a member of British Commonwealth of States and uh, accepting the British uh, uh, crown as the head of the state or the representative of the British crown as the head of the state, but largely they are an independent state. They are a self governing nation but accepting uh, as the British crown or the representative of the British crown as the head of the state and that is what is basically the dominion status, but India is no longer a dominion country. Uh, it is not having this dominion status and it has done away with this particular dominion status when it had its own constitution. On 26 January 1950, India has already become a republic. And what is the next provision of this Indian Independence Act? So, although the British India would be divided into two states, that is the uh, Pakistan and India. And there were also other princely states apart from Pakistan and India. And these princely states were free to join either of the dominion, that is very important. So, they can join India or they can join Pakistan or they can remain as an independent state. You will understand that there are certain uh, princely states that remain independent even after the independence. Say, for example, the princely state of Hyderabad, the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, they remained independent, which was later uh, brought under India by one way or the other by the first Home Minister of India, Mr. Patel. But the provision of the, government, the Indian Independence Act is that if they want, they can remain independent as well. And further, if you see, the Act empowered the countries to have a responsible, to have their respective constituent assembly is very, very important. India can have its own constituent assembly. And in fact, we had our constituent assembly, which was formed in 1946. After independence, few of the members who were part of the Muslim League, so they left the Constituent Assembly and then subsequently the Constituent Assembly majorly had the members from the uh, Indian Territory and then they continued from August 1947 till November 1949 to draft the Constitution of India and it is a sovereign body. When I say it is a sovereign body, it is free to draft the Constitution of India as it wishes. So, there can be no external direction as to how the constant assembly of India can draft the constitution of India that is not possible because it is very much a sovereign body. To draft the constitution and to make the ordinary laws that means the constant assembly of India is not only to act as the body which is to draft the constitution, but it is also to make the ordinary laws. And in fact, they were having the power to amend any law that was made by the British parliament including the government of India Act 1935. Further, if you look into the provision, the provision says the dominion to be administered, that is the dominion of both India and Pakistan to be administered. So, let us not consider about Pakistan. So, the dominion of India to be administered according to the government of India Act 1935. Till the time they had their respective constitution is drafted. So, that means uh, till the time India has its own constitution which shall be drafted by its sovereign constituent assembly, what shall be the provision based on which the country shall be governed? that is based on the government of India Act 1935. That is why I said that this government of India Act 1935 is so significant, it not only because a bulk of the provisions of the government of India Act 1935 has been now incorporated into the Indian constitution, but even after independence, it is the law based on which the government of India was governed. Although the constant assembly was free to uh, amend some of the provisions of this government of India Act 1935, so, that is the important provision you should understand 
with regard to the Indian Independence Act. And most importantly, the act abolished the office of viceroy. So, henceforth, once the independence is given, there won't be any viceroy, but it was replaced by the Governor General of India. So, there was a person who is, will be considered to be the Governor General of India, who would be the head of the state. So, before that, it was the viceroy who was carrying out the Indian affairs before independence. Now, it was replaced by the Governor General, but that Governor General would be appointed by the British Crown on the advice of the Dominion Cabinet. On the advice of the Dominion Cabinet means on the advice of the Indian Ministers, headed by the Prime Minister. So, they would advise the British Crown and accordingly that people will be appointed as the Governor General of India. So, the Indian Ministers at that point of time has recommended uh, Lord Mountbatten to be the first Governor General of India. So, Lord Mountbatten was the first Governor General of India after independence. And further, the act also deprived the British Crown to veto the bills passed by the Dominion Legislature, but transferred this to the Governor General of India. Because anyways, the, now the Governor General of India is the head of the state. And uh, now the Governor General will have the power to veto the bills passed by the uh, Legislature. That is, the Central Legislature, he can veto. Veto means, he will have the power to reject the proposals or the bills which is sent by the Central Legislature. Now, similar power is also there in the uh, President of India. The President of India uh, under certain situations can exercise his veto powers, which we will subsequently discuss. So, a similar provision was there in the Government of India Act 1947. The Act also designated the Governor General of India and the Governors of the Provinces as their respective constitutional heads. That means, for the entire country, there will be Governor General of India, that was Lord Mountbatten at that point of time. For every province, there shall be a governor and they would act as the constitutional head. That means, they are not the real head, constitutional head means ceremonial head and who basically acts upon the aid and advice of the council of ministers. That is the system that we have in our country presently. So, these are the major provisions of the government of India Act 1947. So, our country got independence by the government of India Act, sorry, Indian Independence Act 1947. But, uh, the country was still continued to be governed under the Government of India Act 1935. The Constituent Assembly established in 1946 and it became very active after 1947 after the partition and then it continued to work for another two years, a little more than two years and then drafted the Constitution of India, adopted and enacted on 26 November 1949 and came into force on 26 January 1950 and that is the Constitution of India and that laid down the foundation for our modern nation. And it has been more than 73 years since the constitution came into force and there is no turning back. And the constitution of India is considered to be one of the uh, most important constitutions across the world and it has number of provisions which is unique to itself. So, this is how we will have to understand as to how the various historical backgrounds, the various constitutional developments have influenced the constitution of India. So, with this we are almost done with the historical background and in the historical background we have touched upon both the developments that has happened during the crown rule and before that also in the company rule. But what is more important for your examination is probably what is the development that has happened during the crown rule that is from 1858 till 1947. So, it is also very important for you to revise this particular thing and what you can expect is very rarely you can expect a question in the prelims and very rarely probably in the mains examination also, but we cannot take it for granted. So, let us try to read all the chapters which is given in the book and which may be relevant to the exam also. So, what we will do is we will come with one more lecture and we will try to give a closure to this uh, historical background wherein we will try to revise the entire historical background. So, we will solve around a uh, little more than 20 questions and try to revise the entire historical background uh, uh, topic, but we will do that in the next lecture. So, for maximum benefit, uh, do watch all the lectures and if you watch all the lectures, I am very sure that you can get more than 90 percent of your questions right in the preliminary examination and you will also have a good fundamental understanding as to how to approach your mains examination. So, do keep watching. Thank you very much. All the best. God bless.